we have begun a process of, as a community of faith over the course of the last week where we have been intentionally seeking God, asking Him to show Himself to us, um, asking Him to reveal Himself to us. We talked last week about the fact that, that God is not lost, um, but sometimes we can be. We talked about the fact that uh, we can so easily lose our way in life. We can we can become the ones that are that are um, just sort of floundering around. And, and if, but if we truly will seek Him, we'll find Him. His Word says to us that if we seek Him, we'll find Him. When we seek Him with all our heart, we've said that verse several times already over the past several weeks. And we're going to hear more and more about that as we continue just to stay in this season of seeking. Um, I'm curious to know this morning, since we offered that challenge last week, if anyone can say, you know what, I took the challenge of, of the past seven days to seek the Lord, and here's what I found. Here's where I found it. And, and I'm not asking for you to take 5, 10, 15 minutes. I'm asking for like one sentence or two sentences of, here is the result of me accepting the seeking challenge this week. Anyone can share anything from seeking the Lord this week. This week. Did you find it? Sean? Um, just, not just over the last seven days, but over the last couple of weeks, my cousin had pretty serious heart surgery. He has a heart murmur and he had to get a heart valve replaced. And he actually got to go home a week after the surgery, which is very, very quick. So got awesome. to, gone to care of him and my family. My aunt was very worried about it, so... Awesome. And the cousin's okay. Who has, who has sought the Lord? Okay, right. Gene, real quick. Okay, I found the modern day Nathan the Prophet in Privilege Park. He stayed there. Okay. Okay. And then you're allowed to tell about it. That's awesome. <laughs> yes. Okay. Somebody else. You saw the Lord this week. You asked Him to show Himself to you, and how has and then He's revealed Himself to you? Has He spoken to you through Scripture as a as a verse stood out to you? Has it been just kind of has it kind of hit you between the eyes this week? I've been studying First Corinthians, kind of where, like what we're talking about with the Holy Spirit and like the gifts of the Spirit and what Paul's talking about. Just had some like really cool revelation about why God should this to hear us and the purpose of that. I just he just kind of like I've always read it one way and kind of <laughs> renewed my view of that that kind of section I guess of just like why we have the gifts. And that was really that's really cool. It's awesome. And this is where we're actually heading now over the next course of the next couple of weeks and studying the word together as it relates to seeking the gifts that God has for us. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to ask you over the next coming of, of, the, of the weeks ahead of us, are you seeking Him? And if you are, are you finding Him? And if you're finding Him, then what does that look like? Here's why I'm asking you, not to put you on the spot, and not to, not to not, there's an element of accountability to it, because I want to keep you on track, but here's, here's why I believe it's so important for us to have moments just like this. It's because there's the chances of someone sitting here this morning and saying, I have no clue what you're talking about. I don't, I don't know what it looks like to seek Him. I don't even know what it will be like when I find Him. I don't know what I'm looking for. I don't know what that means. And so to hear you say, I've sought the Lord, and here's how He's shown Himself to me this week. Has a huge opportunity to speak to someone else sitting in here or listening online and causes them to say, oh... That's what that means. That's what seeking the Lord looks like for you. That's what, that's what this, this, this process of seeking and how and this is what the, the results are. And so it's important for you to be able to share that. And I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that over the next few weeks. This morning what I want to do is I want to begin to enter into a, 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 there's some teaching that I really want to do as we, as we begin to seek, seek a specific aspect of what God has to offer us. So we're going to be talking about the gifts of the Spirit that God offers us. Have you ever gotten a gift um, that at Christmas time or on your birthday or, or wherever else, that whatever other holiday, and, and you've, you really didn't know how to use the gift? 
right? You ever had that moment where you open it up and you're like, wow, thank you. You shouldn't have. Really, no. You didn't have to do that. And you walk away and you're like, what in the world am I supposed to do with that? Everyone, anyone ever had that, had that experience? Right? Great, great show happens. At least they're okay. We've got a few of you, my man. You've regifted it, maybe? <laughs> you say, you know, it's still no place for it. I'll give it to someone else. Or, or maybe you, uh, you, you, it's, you know, it's this porcelain fat figurine of, of who knows what. And you're like, I have no, no place to put it. And you just conveniently put it on the edge of your counter so that you walk by and it falls over and it crashes and it's like, oh man, no one's no ever done that. I've never done that either. So <laughs> I was thinking about this. I was thinking uh, when, when Chris and I got married, uh, it, was, it was in June and it was around Father's Day and we, while we were away, we were like, we need to, we need to get Father's Day gifts um, for our dads. And I remember one of the one the Father's Day gift that we got for Christie's dad was a really cool clock. Um, we were we were at SeaWorld and, and and he at the time was really he loved nautical things and he was decorating his office with nautical things and it was a great little clock. And so we were all excited. We we brought it home for my honeymoon and we gave it to him. Happy Father's Day! Yeah. He's like, oh, that's so cool. Thank you. And and so he opens it up and he's like, oh, I need to I need to get a battery for it. We're like, oh yeah, we should have gotten. We should have gotten new battery, so we just assumed that it needed a double A or a triple A battery. No. This clock required some sort of just janked up sort of battery that we we couldn't find. And and, and so we're like, oh, you know what, we'll find the battery and we'll get it for you. Five years later, we were in their house somewhere, and, and, and we were we were at their at their house, and, and I looked up in the closet and I saw the clock that we got for it. And I was like, Hey, I mean, we got your dad that clock, and and he never. I mean, it's up in his closet, and and she's like, Dad, do you remember we never got him the battery for it either? And so now there's this sort of standing joke that's between him and us. When we get him anything for Christmas, it's like, does it require batteries? Well, no, we decided it doesn't work good because I want to be able to use it. I find a lot of times that there are things in our walk of faith that have been gifted to us. Specifically, the gifts of the Spirit. That I really don't know what what to do with it. I, I don't I don't realize that it's a gift that, that I can use, or or I really I, I think well, what, what can I what can I do with that? And I really truly believe that I'm not alone. That that we as Christians can find ourselves in a place where we 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 know that there's more for us to experience. There are gifts for us to experience. But we don't we don't know what they are. We don't know where they are, and we don't we don't know how to receive them. I want to stop for a second. We've got a couple things going on. We've got I need somebody to give me some more volume over in the cafe side because they can't hear. And I'm going to ask this morning that if you if you can um, lean in and fully pay attention to what is being said this morning, um, I'm going to ask you to, to do that. It is uh, we we said at the outset. From the moment of literally getting here at eight o'clock, there was a there was just the sense of hindrance and distraction. There's a lot of a lot of stuff that's happening just in, in there and in here. And so I'm going to stop and I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask you just to lean in with me. All right, I'm not asking you to listen to me. I'm not asking you to 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 honor me as an individual. I'm going to ask you to honor the word because God God has has uh, well I'm ready. That's probably why. So let me. That means my battery is pretty dead. I'm not too bad. Yeah. How, how fitting is that? We'll replace battery. We're going to pray. And we're going to press through. Can we do that? Aren't you glad it's not fancy shirt? <laughs> Lord, we're here this morning to hear from you. And so we're asking you to speak to our hearts. Jesus, you, you said that your sheep know your voice and that they will not listen to the voice of another. And Father, I fully believe that you want to equip this body to do more than just go to church. You want to equip this body to do more than just be good Christians. 
You want to equip us to impact the world around us. You have empowered us with your spirit. And you have called us as your sons and daughters to go into this dark world carrying the light of your son Jesus, empowered by your spirit. And you have given us a mandate. You have given us a divine purpose and call. And Father, I am very well aware of the fact that the enemy would love nothing more than to keep us from fulfilling the purposes and plans of God. He would love to keep us from utilizing the tools and the gifts that have been given to us. Because if we don't use them, then we remain impotent and hopeless. But if we can discover what you have made available to us, allowing you to work supernaturally through us, then the kingdom of heaven advances and the kingdom of darkness will continue to crumble, not because of us, but because of your spirit inside of us. So I'm asking you, Jesus, to hover in this room. Spirit of God, I'm asking you to give us ears to hear and hearts to receive that will listen to your word and that we will not allow ourselves to be distracted from hearing good truth that we so desperately need to apply to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen? amen. Your text this morning is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. There are different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. And there are different activities, but the same God produces each gift in each person. A manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. To one is given a message of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, a message of knowledge by the same Spirit. And to another, faith by the same Spirit. And to another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the performing of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. And to another, interpretations of tongues. One and the same Spirit is active in all these, distributing to each person as He will. And I want to drop down to the end of that chapter, and I want to read verse 31. But desire the greatest gifts, and I will show you an even better way. Spiritual gifts have been made available to us. They are there for us to simply receive. And the Word tells us that we are supposed to desire the gifts. That we are supposed to seek after those gifts. But you can't desire for something if you don't know what it is. You can't seek after something if you have no clue as to what that gift is. You can't open a present if you don't know where to find the present. No one, I mean, you could do the whole scavenger hunt thing and, 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 and try to search it out, but... But when, when, when someone comes to you and they say to you, hey, I've got a gift for you, the act of seeking that gift is the act of opening it up, unwrapping it, and going into the box and pulling it out and looking at it and studying it and saying, oh, wow, with a sincere heart, I'm so thankful for this. I, you shouldn't have, but thank you that you did. But what good is it for us to have gifts if we don't know how to use them? Why would we seek a gift if we don't fully understand their value and their purpose? In my own life, I know that I have been, had a tendency to push the gifts that God has given aside, slide it under a bed, put it up on a shelf, and say, oh, that's not necessarily something that I need right now. But in doing that, what I have done is I have rendered my life ineffective and powerless for the Holy Spirit cannot work through me do what he wants to do. That's the fear I have for most Christians, for you today. It's why I feel so strongly that God wants you to very clearly and intently hear what he has to say. We have all been given gifts by the Spirit. And we may not necessarily know that we have them, and we don't know how to use them, and so we have a tendency to set them off on a shelf, to put them away, or say, well, that's not necessarily for me. And the danger that we have, like some Christians, is that we can, we can, we can kind of be distracted. We can, we, we can approach the idea or the subject of the gifts of the Spirit from three or four different ways. Three of them I have on your notes you want this morning. The first one is that you can focus on one gift as more important 
than the other, other gifts and disregard the others. In the context of faith that I grew up in, the, the denomination that I grew up in, there was one gift that was focused on. And all the other gifts of the Spirit were, were, were never even talked about. I, I, was, I was well into my years before I understood that there was more to experience in letting the Holy Spirit empower my life than just the gift of speaking in tongues. That's what I heard as a kid, and that was, that was it. I mean, if, if you didn't do that, then you didn't have the Holy Spirit. And it was considered one and the same. And it was like, man, this is, this is all that there is. And, and as I got older and I started reading the text that we read this morning, I realized there are more gifts. And so there are Christians who can so easily focus on one and disregard the others. Who can say, well, I'll take this one, but I'm not so interested in that one. Or this one makes more sense to me. This one is a little bit easier to walk in. And I can, I can manipulate it. I can maneuver through it. And they disregard the others. And that's not how it's supposed to be. There are others who say, I have the gift of, and they'll, they'll kind of claim this particular gift as their gift, but they don't realize that they actually have access to all the gifts that have been made available to us. They've all been given to us. There are other Christians who would say that we don't have access to these gifts today. That they were for the early church and that they, that they stopped with the apostles. This belief or this theology is known as a cessation theology or cessationism, meaning that the gifts cease. I don't believe that. When I read what Paul says, Paul doesn't put an expiration date on the gifts of the Spirit. He doesn't say, well, if it, it's just up until this time or it's for so long of a amount of a time. He's, the, it's given to us in the Word and God doesn't put that out to us to, to cause us to think, oh, wow, I wish that we could have lived back then. It's available to us here and now. The gifts of God's Spirit are available to us. We have access, tools, resources, power to overcome, to face the circumstances that are in our life in the, in the form of the gifts of the Spirit, and we simply must know how to use them. I asked this question a couple weeks ago. I'm going to ask it again. What's going on in your life right now? The most, the biggest issue, the biggest question that you have right now. Is it a job situation? Is it a family situation? Is it a financial situation? Is it a health situation? Uh, what is it that's going on in your... You don't have to answer me out loud, but I want you just to think about that thing right now. That thing that you've been thinking about through the entire church service. And you keep going, I need to focus. I need to pay attention. I need to listen. But this is right there. It's almost like this nagging fingernails on the top words, screeching at you kind of, a, kind of a thing. What is that thing? I want you to understand that whatever that thing is that's in your life that you're facing right now, the answer that you need to deal with the, that particular circumstances could very well be found that could in, in, the, in the gifts of the Spirit that have been, have been made available to you. If you are a follower of Christ, then you have access to... To, a, to gifts of power that can speak to that circumstance and such in such a way to where life isn't living you, but you are able to rise above those circumstances. You are able to have faith in your God, walk in a strong relationship with Jesus Christ, and experience the power of His Spirit being manifested, not just on a Sunday morning, but in every day of your life. This is so important for you to understand. You have access to these tools. Before we can understand each of the gifts individually, we have to have a better understanding of the gifts as a whole. And so I want you to understand four very important key principles as it relates to the gifts of the Spirit. And that we find these principles in our text. First, they are gifts. Verse 4 says, now there are different gifts. If you have something for someone and you're going to give it to them, and they come and they take it from you before you actually give it to them, kind of kills the joy of it, doesn't it? They're like, oh, I was going to give that to you. We, 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 there is a receiving process that has to take place when gifts are made available. I don't know what your Christmas tradition is or your birthday tradition is, but in our family, man, it's like it's a production. It's it's like, you know, we, we pass at Christmas time, we pass all the gifts out around the tree, and then we go one by one by one, and so each person opens their gift, and it's at that moment that they receive the gift that they've been given. The gifts of the Spirit are to be received, which means you have to 
engage it. You have to accept it. Now, there, we're going to talk a lot about this over the next couple of weeks. There are people that have this mentality that you've got you to cry out. You've got to beg and wail. There's an old term that was used when I was a kid growing up in church. Have you ever heard of the, of the word tarrying? You heard that? Yeah. Tarrying is, it, it means that you have, to, you have to wait and agonize for it. We used to do communion. I don't know if this just stands out of my mind, but we would do communion very differently at our church. They would literally sit at a table, and they would put seats around the table, and the pastor would, would, um, would invite people to come up and sit at the table, and then he would invite people to come up and stand behind them and to tarry with them. And I was like, a kid. I mean, I was a little, little kid, and I couldn't understand that. And I always thought that Terry was like a scary thing. Just Terry, scary, kind of rhyme. I don't know. But I would be a kid and I was watching and I was like, oh my gosh, I don't want to have to Terry. I don't know. That sounds really bad. And, 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 and people were, I mean, it was very emotional. So people would be standing there and they'd just be crying. And, people, and I was a kid watching and I was like, oh, that's, that sounds horrible. Why do, what, why do we make people Terry? And I, and I feel like that for the Holy Spirit too. I feel like that He feels that about us. We can so easily beg and knock and plead. Oh, God, i got to have more of you. And, and, and all the while he's saying, here, here, I've given you what you need. I'm not going to give you a gift and hold it over your head because you took it. Because I'm asking you to receive it. The gifts of the Spirit are gifts and they must be received. Second key principle is that they are given to each person. Verse 6 says, and, and there are different activities, but the same God produces each gift in each person. Each person means that these gifts are available to anyone who believes in Jesus Christ. God wants all believers to participate in the joy and in the experience of having the gifts of the Spirit. That's what God wants. The question is, do you want What's available for you? The third key principle is that they are manifestations. Verse 7 says, A manifestation of the Spirit is given again to each person for the common good. What's a manifestation? It is, a, it is something that is perceptible by human senses. It can be seen or heard or understood, smelled, touched. It can be, it's, but it's something that is perceptible. The Holy Spirit is invisible. We can't see Him. We can't audibly, physically hear Him moving around in the room. We can't smell Him. We can't taste Him. But He chooses to use the gifts of the Spirit to manifest Himself. To make His presence known. To say, hey, I'm here with you. I'm for you. I'm on your side. I've got something here for you that can help you through this circumstance. It's a manifestation. Fourthly, they are supernatural. Manifestations of God are given through and by the Holy Spirit. They cannot be given or accompanied by human strength or ability. It's not something that you muster up. It's not something that you that you like. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna figure this thing out. I'm gonna make it happen on my own. You can't conjure it up in your own strength. They're supernatural. They have been entrusted to you by the Father. So it's important for us to understand these key principles about the gifts. What are the gifts that God gives us? We're going to look at each of these gifts over the next several weeks. I've got just a short amount of time to unpack the first one, and then, and then I'm going to let you go. This week, we're going to start with the first one. God gives us, according to the text that we read, the message of wisdom through the Holy Spirit. Other translations say the word of wisdom as a gift. I want you to understand, too, the, the distinction between wisdom and knowledge. We're going to talk about the gift of knowledge next week. The gift of the word of knowledge, not the gift of knowledge, the gift of the word of knowledge. Knowledge is informative. When you have knowledge, you have information. Wisdom is directive. Wisdom is the application of the knowledge. It's telling you what to do with what you know. So the, the gift of wisdom is going to be a gift that is going to give you a direction to utilize the knowledge that has been invested or entrusted into you. The message of wisdom is a, according to the four principles that we just looked over, is a supernatural revelation by the Spirit of God. It's not a wisdom that you come to on your own deduction. It is God saying to you, hey, here is something you need to know. Here is wisdom that I'm revealing to you by my power, by my Spirit. What does it, what is the, what does it reveal? The message of wisdom reveals the plans 
and the purposes of God. Reveals the plans and the purposes of God. His wisdom of what He wants, what He desires, what He can see. We know from the Scripture that God is all-knowing. He is all-seeing. He is all-powerful. He possesses all knowledge, all wisdom. Our minds could not, cannot comprehend or contain all that God has. But He imparts to us little nuggets, little bits, aspects of wisdom of His plan and His purpose. If He told us everything that He was ever going to do in our lives, some of us would just crumble. We would, we would self-implode. Are you going to do that in my life? No! We would just, we would just melt. But God incrementally will give us words of wisdom saying, hey, here's what I want to do, here's what I'm going to do, and here's how it's going to happen. The message of wisdom assures us of God's protection and presence in our lives. I want to give you a couple of examples quickly. I, I'm not going to read them. I'm going to kind of encapsulate what's going on here. Acts 27, 23, and 24. Paul is on a, is on a boat, and they're about they're going through a storm. They're about to go through a storm, and and, and and Paul speaks to the people that are on the ship, and he says for them to calm down. In verse 23, he says, "For last night, the angel of the Lord, I belong of the angel of the God I belong to, and serve stood by me, and he said, don't be afraid, Paul." It is necessary for you to appear before Caesar, and indeed God has graciously given you all those who are sailing with you. They are in trouble. They're about to. They're, they're, they're in the process of a of a of a storm, and that's going to wreck their ship. And their ship does get wrecked. And they're trying to figure out what do we do? What do we do? And Paul steps up and says, "Hey, listen. I have heard from God through through an appearance of an angel, and He told me that I've got to get to Caesar. We're going to be okay." It's a word of wisdom. A word of wisdom assuring of God's presence and protection in that particular situation. The message of wisdom applies to Scripture to situations in our lives. Acts chapter 15, verses 13 through 21. Another story that's happening here. This is called, and you, you read, you see in your, in your Scripture, the head of the Jerusalem Council. Gentiles are starting to come to faith in Jesus. And Jew, the Jewish people are like, wow, this is kind of weird for us. We're not quite sure about all this. And there are some Jews, some Pharisees who are, who are following Jesus, who are hearing about Gentiles, and who are they're coming to faith. And they're saying, well, wait a minute. If they're coming to, to faith, then they need to walk through the rite of circumcision. They have to experience, right? So this, is a, this is a painful process for Gentiles. And they're saying they need to go through this. And so there's this whole big discussion that is unfolding and James, one of, the, one of the, the leaders of the church, verse 13, so they stop speaking. James responds and says, brothers and sisters, listen to me. And he unpacks how they've heard how God is revealing himself to the Gentiles. And he, he goes back as he's talking, he refers back to passages of scripture in Amos 9 and Isaiah 45, where God prophesies in his word that Gentiles are going to come to faith. And so James has this word of wisdom, this, this understand, this reminder of what was spoken. And he says, this is that that God's told us about. We need to recognize that. In verse 19, he says, therefore, in my judgment, we should not cause difficulties for those among the Gentiles who turn to God. But instead, we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from eating anything that has been strangled and from blood. For since ancient times, Moses has had those has, has had those who proclaim him in every city and every Sabbath day he is read aloud in the synagogues. And from there, they take the revelation of Scripture that has been given through a, an apostle, through James, this word of wisdom, and they say, okay, we're going to apply this Scripture now. This is where the Scripture steps in, and it changes how they deal with the issue of Gentiles coming to faith. The message of wisdom instructs us to take action. Acts 8, 26 through 29. Philip, another apostle, is being directed by an angel of the Lord. Get up and go south to the road that leads down to Jeru from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he gets up and he goes. And there's an Ethiopian man, an e a eunuch, a high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Verse 28, he was sitting in his chariot on his way home, reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. And verse 29, the spirit tells Philip, go and join that chariot. The message of wisdom, the word of wisdom will instruct you with an action. 
This is what we see. I want, I want you to see the examples in Scripture and then quickly just kind of talk about how it applies in our own lives. In Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 16, Saul, who later becomes Paul, has had an encounter with Jesus. Now, he hated Christians. And he was, he was, he was a bad apple, man. He was all about tearing up Jack and going into the, to the places where Christians were and, 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 t- and arresting them and seeing them be persecuted. And he has this encounter with Jesus. And in Acts chapter 9, there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said, comes to him in a vision and says, Ananias, get up and go to the street called Straight to the house of Judas and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, since he is praying there. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias, which is who the angel is talking to, coming in and placing his hands on him so that he can regain his sight. Now listen, Lord, Ananias answers, I've heard from many people about this man, how much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem, and he has the authority here from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to the Gentiles, kings and Israelites. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. A word of wisdom is given to this man, Ananias, to go do something. That There is risk involved. His life is at stake. But what he's experiencing is the gift of the word of wisdom being demonstrated in his life. And he's been instructed to go do something out of obedience to God's leading. The message of wisdom gives us, will tell us things that are to come for a reason, for a purpose. Acts chapter 11, verse 28. One of them, another disciple or an apostle named Agabus, stood up and predicted by the Spirit that there would be a severe famine throughout the Roman world. This took place during the reign of Claudius. And each of the disciples, according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brothers and sisters who live in Judea. And they did this, sending it to the elders by means of Barnabas and Saul. Listen, we live in a day and an age where people will say, this is going to happen. And they will tell us things that are going to happen. And there are people that say those things and they are speaking on the authority of the Holy Spirit. But let's just call one out that you may or may not have heard about. There's one that says that April 23rd, right, of this coming week, that, that is supposed to be the end of the world. It's, it's a, we've heard of these before. That, that this is when that, that the rapture is going to take place. Jesus is coming back. Everything that we know, the world's coming to an end. Here's, here's, here's what I want you to know. Scripture says that nobody knows. Amen. It's all right. It's all right. Nobody knows. Not even the angels. Never. Jesus himself doesn't. Only the Father knows when that's going to happen. And so the God that I follow, the God that I serve, isn't going to go tell Joe Schmo over here that, hey, let everybody know that the end of the world is coming if he hasn't even told his son that he's going to send him back in. You see, what's happening is that the people will speak and say this is going to happen and they'll claim that it's the Spirit of God. They'll claim that they have a word and their purpose is to create fear and panic. And they're contradicting what we know is being spoken of in the Word. As we step through the study of the gifts of the Spirit, anything that you see that, that, is, that claims to be a demonstration of the gifts of God's Spirit, if it is in contradiction to any part of God's Word, then it cannot be the gift of the Spirit. If someone says, Jesus is coming back tomorrow, and we know that the Word says that no one knows, then it contradicts the Word, so you can thereby recognize that this is not the gift of a Spirit, uh, a gift of the Spirit in operation. It is, it is someone that is operating in their own flesh. They're trying to do something supernatural by natural means, and they're off base. And so you can rest easy knowing that that's not a gift of the Spirit, that's an operation. God gives us these gifts, and specifically the gift of wisdom, because He wants us to understand who He is and what He's doing. He wants us to understand His plans and purposes. He wants us to recognize that His presence is with us. He wants us to invite Him into the circumstances that we are facing and ask Him to help us navigate through those circumstances. We have a responsibility. What is our responsibility? Our text this morning, the last verse of chapter 12, but desire the greater gifts. Paul says, and I will show you an even better way. Skip over one chapter, two chapters for 14. One, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. We are to seek the gifts of the Spirit. This is our responsibility. 
We are supposed to ask him, God, show me the gift in, that you've, um, you've, you've, given, you've given to me. It's in me. It's accessible to me. Help me to understand what to do with it. I know we've talked about this before. We've used the picture, the imagery of tools and a toolbox, and we'll, we'll be doing that as we go through this. But the gifts are so much like that. They're like hammers and screwdrivers and nails and, and all these different tools. And if you're like me, someone who's not necessarily the most handy person in the world, you can walk up to a toolbox and you can feel like that you're just looking at just a bunch of just pieces of metal and wood. But there are some of you, like Bruce, who has an entire, an entire treasure trove of tools. And I can spend hours with him just watching him say, well, when this one you take and you can do this with it. And you can take this one and you can do that, you can do that with it. And he can take tools and he can work wonders and miracles with it because he is skilled in the use of the tools. Whereas someone like myself, I can walk up to his treasure trove and I can be like, uh, flat line, flat line. I just, I don't, I don't know what to do. That's where so many of us are as Christians. And our natural response is to say, I don't understand, therefore I'm going to walk away and I'm not going to experience the gifts. But God has invited you to the tool shed. He's just saying, hey, come over here. I want to show you that the hard times you're walking through, you don't have to walk through them without a tool to help you. So we have responsibility to seek the gift of wisdom. Here's what else we need to do. We need to recognize in our day-to-day -day lives the opportunities for the message of the word of wisdom to be demonstrated in our lives. Go back to that question that I asked you. What's the big situation that you're facing in your life? Recognize that as an opportunity to see this gift on display. I've told you thousands of times about how, how I find myself being here as the owner of the coffee shop and running a business and pastoring a church. And so many times I find myself in over my head. I want to tell you that as I studied this, I was absolutely blown away at the times, at the many, many times that I have recognized that the gift of the word of wisdom, a message of wisdom that God has given to me or to us as, as leaders here to say, this is what you need to do. This is a direction that you need to take. And it's caught me by surprise. And I've sat for hours, days, stressing out, thinking, what in the world am I going to do? How are we going to do this? How are we going to get past this? And all of a sudden, there is this revelation that comes, and it's like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that they would, that was the answer, that, that was, it was so easy to get around the circumstance. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit was exercising a message of wisdom in that particular situation and allowing us to navigate through an otherwise impossible or difficult circumstance. Whatever you're facing right now, he wants you to pick up this gift, this tool, this message of wisdom, and recognize that he has something that he wants to direct you and how to navigate through this situation in your life. Right? Another thing that we do, and I want to challenge you this week, is to recognize conversations with people that you may be in. And you're not quite sure what, what you're going to say, but all of a sudden you're sitting there talking and something comes out of your mouth and you're like, did, did I just say this? You ever had that happen? I found myself in a conversation like that this week. I was talking to somebody. Some tough questions being put in front of me. Man, I don't know how I'm going to answer that. And I begin to open my mouth. And as I do, I'm realizing, oh, that's good. <laughs> and I can't take credit for it. Because it's not me. It's him giving me a message of wisdom into particular situations. And it's like, wow. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit in operation. It's not earth shattering. The, 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 the windows didn't vibrate and doors didn't fling open. And it wasn't, it wasn't earthquakes, but it was a moment. It was a very simple and subtle moment where I recognized he's actively involved in the situations in my life. So we have to recognize conversations. Here's the other thing that's important for us. If we're going to exercise this gift, we have to be willing to take a risk. And there is the chance that you might be wrong. You might think that you've gotten a word of wisdom, and you might say, hey, here's what, I, here's what I feel like the Holy Spirit's saying to me, and it might be that you're wrong. Sometimes God allows us to have those experiences. Why would He do that? Because He wants us to be able to refine our ability to hear His voice. So here's what I found. I recognize that there is a chance that I could be wrong, and so if I feel like I have a message of, a, of a wisdom, a word of wisdom, I'll oftentimes say, I, I could be off. I'm not saying that this is a definite. I'm going to speak it out of obedience. I'm taking a risk to convey this message. 
and I'm going to give it to you, and you can determine whether or not it's from God. And at that point, then I back off, I take my personal emotions and feelings away from it, I move my little toes and my little fingers so that they don't get crushed when the person says, should they say, no, that's not from God. And if they say, I don't, that doesn't rec- register with me, I don't think so, then I, re- I step back and say, okay, maybe I'm wrong. Sometimes that happens. Now, especially for guys, we don't like that. Because we don't like to be wrong. But what is that? That's pride. And so we take the gifts on in the spirit of humility, and we take the risk, and the risk of possibly being wrong, and we continue to be available and willing to let the message of wisdom be spoken to us. This week I'm challenging you to look for opportunities for this message of wisdom to begin. Last week when you left, we, or when you came in, we gave you a rubber band as a reminder to seek His presence this week. Well, this week when you come in, we've upgraded you a bit. And we're, we're giving you a white band. And here's what I'm doing. I'm asking you, I, I tried, to, I don't know if it's still on here. I wrote on here, yeah. I wrote on, on the back of mine, wisdom. And, and over the next several weeks, you're going to be getting these. And these are going to be reminders. And you can do this if you don't. It's up to you. But I'm encouraging you to wear it as a reminder. You start your day out. You're facing circumstances or situations. This is a reminder to say, hey, wow, God, you've given me a gift. And the word of wisdom, the message of wisdom. And I want to seek this gift. I want to see this on display. I want to experience this in my life. So I'm going to ask you to help me see opportunities. I'm going to ask you to help me recognize conversations. I'm going to ask you to give me the courage to potentially be wrong. To take the risk. But I want to step out and I want to experience it. It's okay to step trepidatiously because you're stepping. It's not okay to not pursue. It's not okay to say, I'm just going to set it up on the shelf. I want to close with this. Daniel chapter 5 is the story of Daniel. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is long gone. Belshazzar is now king of Babylon. And there is this thing that's happening. They're sitting around and they're having this big old party. And a hand appears out of nowhere and begins to write this message on the wall. Now Belshazzar has taken, the, has taken things that have been confiscated from the temple of God in Jerusalem and they're, they're, they're using the tools, the chalices, the cups, the plates, all these things, and they're using them as far as their banquets and, and it's just a, it's a, it's a bad, bad scene. And this moment happens where this hand appears and all of a sudden there's fear that just settles over at the entire room and, and so he begins to call on his magicians and his and his wise men, somebody tell us what this message, what, what's, what this, this handwriting on the wall is. And they, and they can't find, they can't find anyone. But someone speaks up and says, there's a man in your kingdom who has a spirit of the holy gods in him. Now, they, they're, not, they're not speaking in the context of the, of the people of Israel, so they're not, they're not using our language. But they recognize something very supernatural about this man. They recognize that he operates in something that is otherworldly, that's different. And they say, he, he, in, in the days of your predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, he was appointed by, by, to be chief of his magicians, mediums, and the Chaldeans, and, and diviners. Your own predecessor, the king, did this because Daniel, the one the king named Belteshazzar, was found to have an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and intelligence, and the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems. Therefore, call him, and he will give the interpretation. Daniel had the gift of the message of the word of wisdom, and he knew how to operate it, and he would interpret dreams for Nebuchadnezzar, and now he's put on the spot to interpret what the handwriting on the wall is, and he delivers a message to Belshazzar that's not a very easy message, but he does it anyhow. Daniel is used to influence an entire nation to speak on behalf of God. We will trust God to utilize these gifts in us. He will give us the ability not only to speak into our own situations, not only to navigate through our own circumstances, but our world is in a very dark place. And what our world needs is some people to step up and to be able to read to them the writing on the wall 
to say to them, this is why you're experiencing what you're experiencing. This is where your pain is coming from. This is why you have the hopelessness that you have. This is why you're lost and you're confused and you're depressed. This is why our marriages are falling apart. This is why people are committing suicide. This is why we see the epidemics that we see in our world. If the body of Christ will not step up in the authority of the Holy Spirit, exercising the gifts of the Spirit, namely today, the word, the message of wisdom, then we miss an opportunity to do what we've been called to do, and that is to impact a world that so desperately needs what we have. I'll leave this question with you this morning. If you had in you the cure to cancer, and you carry that message around, that, that cure, that answer inside of you, and you knew <coughs> that there were people around you that were dying of the disease, and you didn't share the cure with them, how could you live with yourself? You have the cure. Cancer the Spirit of God has empowered you. When you come into relationship with Jesus Christ, He says, Now, let me work through you to supernaturally affect change in the world around you. But the question is, will you seek the gifts, the tools, the means by which He calls <coughs> us to bring hope to the world? 